so you want to survive Squid Game. Let's talk about the math behind it. Let's start with red light, green light. I'm gonna try to keep the gore to a minimum, but apparently it's a rather intense children's game. Some shots will have blood. If you aren't familiar with the rules of red light, green light, the rules are very simple. So simple, a child can play. There is a person at the front of a very large room, and whenever they turn around and say green light, you can try to cross. But when they turn around to face you and say red light, you must stop and remain completely still. If you're caught moving during red light, then you lose, and you're sent home, given a pat on the back, and are given a nice trophy. No, I'm kidding. That isn't what happens here. Elimination in this game means death, and nobody was told beforehand. As you can imagine, this wasn't taken very well. At this point, you realize that Squid Game is a reality show with a very harsh punishment. The weakest link is cut in the most brutally efficient way. My wife and I were watching Squid Game concurrently with Great British Baking Show, and that made elements of the baking show perhaps a little bit more haunting than usual. The baker who will be leaving us this week is Sora. <laughs> So Red Light Green Light is a very simple game, and you might wonder, well, where does the mathematics come in? There's one aspect of the game that the players even picked up on, and that the child at the front is using computer motion tracking in order to spot people who are moving during Red Light. So why don't we go ahead and talk about motion tracking and how you can win against it. For motion tracking, there's one algorithm that is the gold standard, and that is the KLT feature tracking algorithm. It's a really easy to understand algorithm, and it's included as part of MATLAB's computer vision toolbox. Essentially, you have an object that you want to track, and you would like to know how much it is moving. So you take two frames from your video, and then you take their difference. Then you take a look at the sum of the squares of the difference at each pixel, and you define that as your metric, defining how far apart these two images are. Suppose we have a single white pixel that is moving in a black background, and we would like to know how much it moved. If we have two images of this moving pixel, then all we need to do is we need to shift one until it's lining up with the other one. When they're not aligned, we're gonna end up getting the sum of the squares of the difference between the two pixels as being two, because we're always gonna have a black minus a white pixel and a black minus a white pixels in two different places. And everywhere else, they match up because it's all black pixels. Then when they all line up, we have black pixels everywhere matching and the two white pixels matching. Then those differences are gonna be zero everywhere. So then the sum of squares distance is going to be zero. And so then we can keep track of how much we had to move one image to match up with another one. And then that tells us how much the actual pixel has moved between the two images. Of course, images that we care about are a lot more complicated than just one white pixel moving around in a frame. And there's a lot of different things happening in the video other than just the movement of two pixels. So you're never actually gonna have an identically zero distance when you align the two images. So instead of looking for how much we need to move an image to get a zero distance, we need to look at how much we need to move the image to get the smallest difference possible. Since we only care about that small thing in our picture, we're only gonna put a bounding box and that's what we're gonna end up considering. All right, now let's see what happens to the distance between these two images as we move them around. You see, the distance is the smallest when the two balls line up. Now, if we want to track an object over several frames, this is going to be way too computationally heavy because we don't want to move pictures around arbitrarily until we find the minimum over every single possible motion because that's a lot of considerations per frame. And if we have 60 frames per second, well, that's way too much. So the trick behind this algorithm is that they rig up a Newton-like iteration. And this utilizes fixed point iteration, and you may have seen my video on that here. Essentially, they take two images and they represent them as F and G, and they shift F around to match G. Now, instead of using F directly, they use a linearization of F to shift it around. So F of X plus H times F prime of X, where F prime is really the gradient of F. And the idea is that if you only use a very small neighborhood of H's, then that's gonna represent F pretty close. And of course, we're assuming here that between two frames coming at like say 30 or 60 frames per second, that you're not gonna need a very large H anyway. Now to find the best shift, what they do is they take that distance we found earlier and they go ahead and plug in F plus H times F prime and G inside of there. And then they minimize over H, which means that we're gonna take that error and we're gonna take its gradient and we're gonna set it equal to zero. And this gives us an equation in terms of H, and our goal is to solve for H, which gives us this equation here. Now this is pretty close to the entire picture, but they do change things by adding a weight. 
and then they turn this into an iterative algorithm. And so it, you can see it just like this. And this is a sort of Newton's type of method. And what is really important about using the Newton's type method is that we no longer need to try every single agent in the neighborhood, but we can use Newton's method to hop over there in just a few steps. And so this is how motion tracking is typically done. Of course, people have done a lot of work since the 1980s, but it's a baseline to start with. Motion tracking, you can see, is very, very simple. It does the only thing you can do from a camera, which is compare frames that are next to each other. And so if you stay still enough and you don't move significantly between two frames, then it's not gonna really detect any motion. Also, the player has even realized if you put somebody between you and the camera, the camera's not gonna pick up any motion at all. But yeah, so now you know how to survive the first game of the Squid Games, and if you wanna learn how you can survive game two, well then please like and subscribe and come back next time.